presented. how to 
distract from it, I couldn't tell, you know. Um, and it was humbling. Like, that was the first thing I learned. You know, I need to be humble because, you know, there's nothing, you know, I'm not going to come here and enlighten you guys on something, some amazing thing that I learned from the scriptures. Like, it's, you know, you know that's going to come from God. You're going to get your enlightenment from, from God. I'm just hoping to, to share a few things that, that I know, you know, as I realized, you know, as I read through the scriptures. You know, and when you think of, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all being one, but yet being different at the same time. Like, that's just a concept that's so hard to understand with our feeble, you know, minds, right? Like, we don't even use the full capacity of our brain, so how can we ever fully understand what the transfiguration really was and what it was really all about? There's just so much information right there in just, in just these, uh, you know, first few lines of, the, of this passage. You know, it would be arrogant for me, you know, really, just to think that I had some great revelation, this new thing uh, that, that I wanted to share with you. But, you know, hope, I hope, I hope we can, you know, go through the scripture, and, and all that I can really do is just humbly bow and reverence, you know, to this, uh, to this scripture, you know, and to, and to God as, well, as I tried, you know, to even understand really what was going on in, in this particular uh, passage. You know, but on that note, I did, you know, did do some research. You know, I'm not, I didn't cop out. I did do some research and tried to Amen. learn as much as I could about this, uh, about this passage. You know, and it was great. You know, it was great to look through it and hear and read some different um, scriptures and, and read from different, you know, thought leaders and uh, watch some sermons. And it was just a lot of really cool information that I was able to to get, you know, through. But um, but I want to just kind of go through it and see if I can go through it like verse by verse. That was the the most effective way for me to really kind of understand it, you know. But the first verse, in verse 2, it says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain. You know, there's, there's debate on what mountain this was, who, you know, how big the mountain was. That's irrelevant. <laughs> you know, they were up high. They were on a mountain. Um, and they were alone, right? And, and there he was transfigured before them, right? So even that word, transfigured, right? It's like just one of those throwaway words. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you read the Bible and, and it's just a it's just a word kind of thrown in there somewhere and you know if you, you you can read right through it and just blow past it and not really get the gist of what that word means. You know, so of course, you know, I'm, I'm like, all right, let me let me understand this word a little bit more. Right? So the word transfigured is tra the transfigured is translated from from the Greek word, you know, as metamorpho, right? Um, so I did a little Greek research. I was always like depressed when I was seeing preachers talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Greek, uh, the Greek uh, word metamorpho, it means to change into another form, to transform, to transfigure, right? Um, you know, but you know, I, I was thinking about that word, and you know, you know, you know, Barrison used this phrase before, like to lean into conversations, like to not just let things kind of hit you, smack you in the head, and go by, but just you know, dig a little deeper, go, go a little further, try to find out a little bit more about this. So that's what, you know, that's what I did. I started thinking about this, you know, so I thought about, you know, the butterfly thing, you know, and, and we have this book in my in my house called the, um, the uh, what's it called? The, the Very Hungry Caterpillar, yeah. Yeah. right? All right. <laughs> so we have this book, you know, and it's a cool book, right? You know, all, all my kids read it, you know, it's, it's nice, it has a lot of cool pictures of it. It's like this little caterpillar that's eating everything. Mm -hmm. So like junk food, it has a tummy ache, and then it eats a, a leaf, and it feels great, you know. Then it turns into a, a, a cocoon, and then it, and then it morphs into a butterfly, right? But you know, the butterfly is uh, it's beautiful, right? And it's a, it's, a, it's an amazing creature. It looks it looks pretty. It's it's pretty uh, it's pretty amazing, you know. And we all know when we look at a, a crack caterpillar, we're just looking at a, a, a butterfly that, that that hasn't had its upgrades yet, right? It hasn't uh, it hasn't <laughs> gone through that that process of change yet, you know. And, uh, and this is uh, this is what it looks like, right? This is what a caterpillar's you know process kind of looks like. You know, how are you supposed to know that this ugly little bug is going to become anything else other than a bug? Like if you went to you know back into your you know childhood before you learned that this fact that uh, the caterpillars became butterflies before before you knew that, right? Like if you could step back and you looked at that bug, you wouldn't see anything else but a bug, right? You wouldn't be able to comprehend that this is going to be something else. Right. You know, and um, and that's what and that's what happens. That's what metamorphosis is. It, it, it ch it's a complete change. You know, it's a completely different thing. It's not different. I, I shouldn't say different. It's just upgraded, right? It's just a software that's been that's been upgraded. You know, and you know, so you know, the, the funny thing as I was doing this sermon, 
you know, uh, getting stuff ready. You know, my wife was have, has like little herbs that she gets from the farm that she was kind of rooting. So they were on the windowsill in the kitchen. And then uh, lo and behold, we see a little caterpillar walking around, you know, on the windowsill. And I'm like, oh, look at that. You know, God is, God is trying to tell me something, right? <laughs> so I get, the, I get the, you know, the caterpillar off and, you know, my wife is there and I'm like, look, honey, look at it. She's like, yo, get that ugly thing out of my face, right? <laughs> like, even, even though she knows, right, that this caterpillar is just, you know, a, 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 a butterfly waiting to happen, like, you know, she still, you know, had a reaction to it, like still get that, Get that thing out of here. That's not what I what I what I, what I, what I, what I want to see. But if it was a butterfly, no, she would let it flutter, flutter all over her. You know, it'd be, it'd be awesome. Right? But, but that's the thing. Like we don't know. Like if we don't know. You know what something can become. It becomes it becomes hard to really uh, understand it or to to really get a get a gist of uh, of the nature of the love and how beautiful it is. Right. But when we look at Jesus, right. You know, when we look at Jesus through the scriptures, sometimes it's hard for us to remember and recall that, you know, this is just version one of Jesus, right? right? There's a there's a 2.0 coming, right? And that's kind of what the, the disciples were able to see. They were able to see Jesus 2.0, you know, as he, as he was able to morph just a little bit, just so they could kind of crack the seal, just to see a little bit of what, of what, of what heaven was like, you know? And that was pretty, pretty amazing, right? So, so there's this, this is part of the scripture, right? It talks about bleach, right? It talks about, uh, how to, it says, uh, I want to make sure I quote it correctly. It says, his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them, right? So, of course, my mind goes right to bleach. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, bleach, they had bleach back then. <laughs> no, they did not. You know, um, so they didn't have bleach, but what they did have was a way to make clothes white. They, they had a process of whitening things uh, and, and making things become white. But it, of course, the scripture says it was more dazzling, more radiant than, uh, than anything that can be bleached. So, of course, the word, you know, bleach, you know, I didn't look it up. Greek, <laughs> right? So I, I don't know if I can say this word right, but I'm going to try. Still bang. It means glistening, gleaming, a change of form, or an effulgence, right? That's a good word. That's not great. What's, what's, what's that, guys? Well, that's <laughs> Effulgence. So it's a bright, a brightness taken to the extreme, right? You may be dazzled by it, stunned by it, or even overcome by it. Usually it refers to the sun or some other mega star. Right, so that's what Jesus looked like. Wow. Like, that's how intensely bright he looked. You know, and if you if you could imagine just being there, if you can just, you know, imagine yourself being in that situation, like it wasn't that Jesus was reflecting the light of God. You know, it was that he was revealing himself. Wow. You know, the light was coming out of him, and that was what was just glowing and radiant about it. You know, and it just made me think that, you know, we don't reflect God, right? We are not the moon that reflects the sun, but we are the one whom the sun lives, right? So I'm going to say that again, right? We are not the moon that reflects the sun. We are the one whom the sun lives, right? So that's, you know, that's the beauty of, of Christ, right? You know, when he's in us, we shine, we glow. You know, we have this brilliance about us. And that's what, you know, Jesus was able to kind of kind of show a little bit of who he was in, in, in that moment. You know, this is a quote that I you know, took from, the, from this uh, preacher, uh, Bill Johnson. I don't know much about him, but I thought that was a cool uh, <laughs> quote he had. You know, it's a little play on words, son and son. But, you know, what he was, what he was trying to explain and what the scripture is really trying to explain is that Jesus wasn't human. You know, this is like a reminder that he wasn't like us. He was something greater. You know, is something greater than us. All right. In verse 4, it says, And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They, they, they were so frightened, you know. And uh, so before I go on, I just wanted to, like, when you look at 
the scriptures and he talks, you know, Peter, I mean, excuse me, it's uh, Elijah and Moses. It's like, all right, why, why these two characters, why these two people out of all, you know, of, of history? You know, why, why is it Moses and Elijah? What are some other pretty amazing people out there, right? There was David, there's Adam, right? The first one, you know, there's Joseph, who's the, you know, not, you know, one of the, one of the first people to help, you know, the Israelites, protect the Israelites, get them out of, uh, set them up to, to get out of Israel. So there was a lot of other people that could have been called, but Moses and Elijah were the two that was called, you know, and that the two that came, you know, and, you know, but my question is, right, you know, so, so we're talking thousands of years ago, like, how did, how did Peter know that this was Elijah <laughs> and Moses? Like, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, they didn't have Facebook, you know, <laughs> <laughs> couldn't, couldn't look him up, couldn't, you know, do a screenshot and, like, figure out who's, who's this guy and tag him, you know, like, there was no way for him to know that. Like, how could he possibly know that, yeah. you know, and, um, and this could, could this be just another moment of, uh, of just another aspect of the power that was on that mountain at the time, the power that was manifesting on that mountain. Like, they knew something that they had no business knowing. Like, they just knew it, you know, inherently that, you know, this is Jesus, this is Elijah, and this is Moses. You know, I should do so. <laughs> let, me, let me build a tent. <laughs> you know, let me, let me protect him. So, like, he didn't know, he was just like, perplexed. He didn't know what to say, what to do. Like, I got. I got to do something here. Like, you know, this is this is this is amazing. You know that I'm that I'm here. That I'm able to see all this. You know, but if we rewind just like a little bit, you know, why did why was it Moses and Elijah chosen? You know, and I was reading something, and they were talking about like when you refer to the scriptures or when the disciples refer to the scriptures, because obviously they didn't have the Bible then. They referred to it as the Law and the Prophets. That's what the scriptures were referred to as the Law and the Prophets. And also, who brought the law, right? That was Moses. He was the supreme lawgiver. He was the one that brought God's law to earth. And, uh, and then who was Elijah? Well, he was the first prophet, probably the greatest prophet. You know, so they brought the greatest of the lawgivers and they brought the greatest prophet. You know, and, that, and they all converged right there on the mountain with the great one himself, Jesus. You know, so when that all happened all together, it was, it was, it just kind of, we reaffirmed some things to Jesus that he was doing the right thing. He was on the right path. And, and they were actually up there. They had a dialogue. They were having a conversation. And, uh, and, and I don't want to get ahead of myself too much, but there was a lot of some, some nuanced things that happened up there as well. You know, <clears throat> so, but the other thing too is, you know, there was, there was those three there, but there was also Peter, James, and John. They were up there, you know, on the, on the mountaintop. So they got, they got a chance to eavesdrop a little bit, you know, hear what, what a holy, a holy conversation in that they probably had no business hearing. Like, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, my parents were having conversations or adults was up were in the room, like I would kind of find a little mm -hmm. nick niche in the corner mm -hmm. or somewhere and just kind of kind of hang out, you know, you can, you can kind of hear some things, you probably things I shouldn't have heard, you know, as a kid, right? But some kids, you know, don't do that. But, um, <laughs> but, but there were also other things that you that you would be able to hear that were just amazing, you know, like amazing stories and different things that, that have happened. So this is what these three guys were able to do. They were able to kind of be there and hear something amazing happening, you know. But unfortunately, you know, it wasn't probably the conversation that they really wanted to hear, right? Because in uh, in Luke chapter Luke chapter nine, verse thirty to thirty one, this is the conversation that Jesus was having with Elijah and Moses. He says that the two, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he had, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at the time, right? So they, they spoke about his departure, right? So again, it's one of those words that's kind of just throw away, like you're not paying attention to it. But what was Jesus about to do? He's about to depart. He's about to die. He's about to be crucified. So they were, this is the conversation that they were talking about. Mind you, prior to this, you know, Jesus had already just told them that I'm, I'm going to die. Some of you will not see death before, before the kingdom comes. Like, so Jesus was kind of prepping them. So it's kind of one thing when somebody's telling you, like, my mom, my mom and dad, you know, when I was a kid, they don't do this parents. But they used to tell me, one day I'm going to die. One day I'm going to die. I'm like, you know, I'm five. I'm going to die. <laughs> but, like, this was a conversation that my, my parents would have. So, so after a while, you're kind of like, eh, whatever. You're never going to die. Like, you know, and, um, and, and, and but, but this is where Jesus, uh, what Jesus was saying to, 
you know, his disciples. So now they hear it from Elijah and Moses. They're saying it now. So now it's real. Like, that's like a doctor telling me, you know, something unfortunate. You know what I mean? Like, that's a whole different story. You know? <laughs> stay with me. Stay with me. <laughs> you know? But that's a whole different story. But when you think about it again, Moses and Elijah, these were their heroes in the yeah. faith. Like, these were two powerful figures that they knew almost everything you could know about a person. Like, they, they, they knew their history was told, repeated to them over and over again, yearly. You know, they had these stories and they, they had these conversations about the great things that they've done and, and who these men are. So to hear them say, you know, must have shook them, you know, in a way that they weren't, sh sh weren't, weren't, weren't shaken or, or shook, uh, shook before, excuse me. <clears throat> You know, so, so they got a chance to hear and be part of, of this holy, holy plan. You know, but they also got to hear, got to hear that Jesus, you know, was going to die, that he was going to suffer. You know, and it's, you know, and it's just one of those things that you don't always want to hear. You know, and it's not something that you necessarily want to hear. But it was good for them to be there, like Peter said. It's good for them to be there because now they're a witness. They're all three are witnesses to something great. Can you imagine them coming down the mountain? And then it was just one of them. And then he said, I saw this amazing thing. They were like, ah, God, yeah, I don't believe it. But all three of them now, yeah. you know, now there's, now there's evidence. Now there's witnesses behind it. So there's a, there's a method to the madness, I think. Not madness, but there's a method to um, Jesus always bringing three around them. Because then they have, you know, three people that they can compare notes. And now they can all share this information, you know, and, um, and not get their facts, and facts uh, across or what have you. All right, so then, so then there was this, you know, in verse 7 it says, then a cloud appeared and covered them. So I found a mountain with a cloud on it. You know, you just <laughs> put you what I'm doing here, right? So, so then, a, then a cloud appeared and covered them. Now, <laughs> clouds, you know, for Jews, clouds, clouds would meant something. It wasn't just like, oh, it's a cloud. You know, it's, it, it meant something. It's, it, you know, it, 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 was, it was meaningful to them. There was a legitimate connection between God and clouds. Like, if you, think, if you look through the scriptures, you know, it was a cloud that Moses, it was in a cloud that Moses met God, right? It was, in the, it was in the cloud that God came to the tabernacle. It was also in the cloud that, that filled the temple when, um, when it was dedicated after Solomon built it, right? And it was also, and it was a, the dream of the Jews that when Moses, when the Messiah came, the cloud of God's presence will return to the temple. Mm -hmm. You know, so the cloud has significance to it. So when the cloud came, that was, you know, that was something. Like something was about to happen, mm -hmm. right? And then a voice came from the cloud. <laughs> like, all right, cloud, now a voice, like this is getting intense. So they're already terrified, right? They need to send a cloud on top of them, and then and a voice comes out of it, and the voice says 10 words, right? This is my son. Whom I love, listening to him. It's intense. Like I get chills just thinking of right this moment. Like that's that's insane. That's intense. Like how do you how do you how do you deal with that? How do you handle that? You know, if uh, you know God never you know didn't speak directly to Moses you know in this moment. He didn't speak to Elijah in this moment. It was only about Jesus. He had only had these things to say. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. You know, and and right there is confirmation <laughs> enough. Like if you were there, if I was there, you would hope. I would hope that you know that was enough for me. Like that's it. I'm all right. This is who he said he, he says he is. Like I have no other doubt. I have nothing to fear. I have nothing to consider. This is it. I'm in the right place. You know. But God knows us. You know. He knows these three men. He knew that they weren't perfect. He knows that we are not perfect. He knows we need constant reminders. You know of this you know sometimes we can fall into this trap like you know life kind of happens around us and we just kind of move along with it but we don't really understand and, and quite get what God is trying to tell us you know so there's another scripture in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 you know where it just talks about Jesus and who he is right you know so, you know, so this is a good reminder just who Jesus is it says in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in, many, in, in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, 
whom he appointed heir over all things, and through whom all through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Right, that's some powerful stuff right there. Right. You know, but if you don't really <laughs> pay attention, like this, this stuff will kind of go over your head. You know, when you just read through the scriptures quickly, you know, there's some of these things we don't mean, we don't catch because we're just kind of reading through it. You know, and I'm very guilty of that. I've read the scripture a bunch of times, but it didn't hit me until it hit me, to, you know, this week when I read the scripture in, uh, in, in, in contrast to, uh, to the transfiguration. You know, but a little bit about this, the writer of the, the, the Hebrews, like, so I can get some research on this guy. He's, you know, and for all intents and purposes, they, they believe that he was, you know, he was, one, he was an amazing writer. Like this passage of scripture is looked at as one of the, the most, um, how, how the word they use, like they use psalmist, one of the, one of the, one of the most well-written verses in the Bible. Like it's just, it's, the language is beautiful. Like this person was probably an orator, like a, a Greek writer. Like the Greek back in those times, they took real high pride in writing. Like it, it was an art, you know, it was beautiful. Like you ever seen stenography or, you know, like just calligraphy, beautiful handwriting. Like it was a beautiful art. Like people take great pride in that. But this is, you know, words, you know, this is, you know, someone, someone speaking, you know, this was a, you know, really intense and, and, and high and highly trained, you know, in writing, you know, and this is what this person came up with. So he, he tried to find the most intelligent, sophisticated language that he can present so that so he can sh share with us in our in our limited minds, you know, who God is, you know, what God and what God is. You know, so you know, he, he used all his talent and all his uh, and all his ability. And it, and it, and it came up this uh, story I was reading about this, you know, about this um this acrobatic tumble. I don't know if some of you guys may have heard of it, you know, um, you know, the I think the, the Virgin Mary and the Tumbler. Like, so, so essentially the story goes, you know, this, there was a monk, he went, you know, he, he felt like he had nothing to give. He, like, he didn't have a lot of talents, he didn't have, a, he wasn't the smartest person, he couldn't do a lot of things that these other monks could do. So, you know, one day he was kind of cleaning up in um, one of the temple areas, and there was a Virgin Mary there, and he couldn't get back down to worship with the rest of them, and he was feeling depressed, and he was like, you know what, I'm here I'm by myself, all I can do is dance, so I'm gonna just dance in front of this statue. So he's dancing, he's break dancing, he's doing backflips, cartwheels, he's doing everything, he's doing the most, right? And he, he finally, you know, exhausted, and he drops before the, the, the statue, and he's like, ah, I'm done. And he's just there sweating. And the story goes, this Virgin Mary comes to life, wipes his brow, and says, you know, thank you. You know, essentially, like, you, you that's all I need. And the, and the moral of the story is, just give what you have. You never know the blessing that's gonna come out. Mm -hmm. Like he was able to just give everything he had, and the blessing was he was able to, you know, interact with the with this statue that came alive. And the story goes on, he died, and the statue takes him to, to heaven or something. It's, it's weird. I don't know. I don't know. It just, it just, I just made a turn. It just it just got weird. But <laughs> the story the story is is the, the, the same. The concept, the moral of it is just to bring all your talents to God. You know, yeah. we don't know what God is gonna do with our talent, with our ability, yeah. you know, and he can do some amazing things. Um, you know, just look around this room. You know, there's a lot of miracles in this room. A lot yeah. of people have amazing gifts and talents. You know, the people that come up to sing, the people that come up to speak and preach, we have this a room full of talented individuals, you know, and, uh, and that's what God wants. He wants us to give himself up he wants us to give of ourselves to him and let him use it the way he wants. Um, but back to the to the scripture. You know, so the so the prophets, you know, they 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 use many different words and things to, to prove God, right? They want us to prove, you know, who God was. And you know, have you even to today today you have philosophers and people that like to debate to try to prove who God who God is through speech. You know, when the speech fails, they try to use other means, dramatic actions and you know, different things, wars and stuff like that will break out as a result of that. But Jesus did not need to do any of these things to reveal himself to, to us, to reveal God to us. All he needed to do to show us God was to show us his true nature, right? In that moment when he transfigured, he was just showing who he really is, you know, and, it, and that was enough, you know, to, uh, to really understand.
understand the fullness of it, you know. But in the scripture, right, that, that, that we're reading, oh, I'm get far ahead of myself. It says the, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, right? You know, so there's that word radiance again, that effulgence, the brightness taken to the extreme. You know, that's who Jesus was, the exact representation of his being. You know, like, if you don't, you know, so when I thought about that, it was like, you know, in other scriptures it talks about, you know, how God made man in his image. This wasn't in his image. This was his being. This is God here on earth. That's what we, that's what, that's what he is. You know, he wasn't a, and he wasn't a reflection. He was him. Amen. You know, so, you know, he, he is, he is Jesus and Jesus is him, you know. Um, if I had a <laughs> uh, so we, we don't need to look at any of the other prophets. I mean, their prophets are there for us to learn from still. We don't ignore them and abandon them, but we look to Jesus. We look through yeah. those lenses now. Yeah. Those are the lenses that we put over our eyes and that we look at the world, you know, through the, through the lens of Christ, you know. You know, can you imagine what it was like for Jesus, no, excuse me, for Peter, James, and John to witness all of this? in this moment, mm -hmm. right? Just put yourself in that situation. Amen. What would it have been like? This would have been just an intense, uh, intense moment. You know, <clears throat> you know. In, uh, in another version of the Transfiguration in, uh, in Matthew chapter 17, it says, uh, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched him. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. You know, and that's such an honest reaction, right? You know, so after all this is happening, you know, so you gotta, you gotta kind of go through the progression of things, right? Jesus, you know, in this moment, Jesus is glowing, right? You know, their heroes, Moses and Elijah, are there talking to him. Then a cloud comes, and now God speaks. Like, what other reaction will you have other than to drop to your knees? Mm. Like, yeah, and, you know, that's what else can you do? What can you say? You know, and they were terrified. You know, I would be going like this in an instant, in a heartbeat, terrified. You know, are you ready to meet your me? Like, I wouldn't, I don't know. You know, that's, that's scary. I wouldn't be ready if I was alone, but if I had Christ there, I'll still drop to my <laughs> But I wouldn't be as, no, I'll still drop. You know, but, <laughs> but, but you get, you get, you know, you're terrified still, but, you know, we, we have, we have Jesus there. Can you imagine if Jesus wasn't there? You know, if Jesus you know, wasn't there, what would that have been like? You know, it was already an intense situation, but we know you know, when what happened when the cloud descended on the mountain when, when Moses was there, Moses, you know, God said, don't even touch the mountain, mm. right? Or you will surely die, mm. you know? So can you imagine, like, the, the amount of fear that went through these men in this moment, you know, that they that they were able to, to be there, be in that space, and hear God's voice, you know, all in, all in that moment. It was just an amazing uh, situation. You know, but but what does Jesus do in this situation, right? He, he sees it terrified, he sees it on the ground, and he just comes out and touches him. You know, don't be afraid. Like, it's always amazing when Jesus goes and touches somebody. Like, there's some amazing things that happen. You know, it's like he, he, he invigorates people. He puts so much courage in the person. He heals them. He gives them what they need in that moment from that touch. You know, and that's and that's just an amazing quality of Jesus. That's something I love, I love you know, about Christ. You know, the way He touched people, the way He came to people. You know, met them where they were. You know, and uh, and what Jesus, and what Peter, James, and John needed from Jesus in that moment was was just His security. They needed to feel safe. They needed to know that things were going to be okay. And that's what God, and that's what Jesus was able to give them in that moment. You know. But when I think about it, one thing that kind of stands out to me was just how how fearful these three men felt in the presence of the cloud. They were terrified in the cloud. But when it came to God in the flesh, they felt safe. And that's the, that's the nature of Christ. Like, he, he wants to bring us all to him. He's not trying to push us away and scare us. 
to terrify us, but he's trying to draw us to him. He wants us to be close to him. You know, in order for us to do that, we have to transfigure ourselves. We have to surrender, we have to change to be different and, and, and allow him to be near us and allow him, which will allow us to be near him. You know. So in uh, another verse, you know, so we continue on as they start to get ready to go down the mountain. Um, and I'll go through this, this part here. So suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do, you, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer so much, suffer much, excuse me, and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come and they have done to him everything they wish, just as they did not die. So, again, we see the disciples were still trying to wrap their minds around what was going on. Right? This was all this in, in intense you know, situation. You can, you can just imagine just sitting there and you know, being in that situation. It's just, man, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to absorb. It's a lot to wrap our minds around. And, um, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, so they, you know, when, they, when you look at it, they literally, you know, just leaving the mountaintop. You know, they were having their you know, faith at the pinnacle, at the peak as, as it's ever going to get. You know, they spoke, they heard from God, they didn't speak to them. They spoke, you know, God spoke to them from the cloud. With Jesus, they saw their heroes in the faith. You know, now they're now they're coming down the mountain. Now they're walking down the mountain, and, uh, and it's coming back to reality. You know, as they're coming down, it's like, you know, you you know, we all have those moments. We you know, we you know, the women are they're coming back. You know, today from their uh, women's retreat, so some of them are going to be glowing, on fire, <laughs> excited. You know, but then reality comes comes, comes in many times and just snatches that excitement. You know, and, and challenges, you know, so so we have to fight, you know, in those moments to keep that, you know, to keep that intensity, to keep that, that fire glowing and, and burning. You know? But unfortunately, you know, sometimes that glow tends to tends to die down. So, you know, we see them coming down the mountain and you know, and then they have questions. They're like, all right, so this is God, you know, <laughs> this is Christ, you know, you know, this is the Messiah. So why uh, did they say that Elijah has to come first? Like, I'm, I'm not quite getting that. So now they, they're, now they're, try, they're trying to process and understand all this. You know, and everything they thought they knew about the Messiah was being shaken. It was being turned upside down. They thought the Messiah was going to come. It was going to, you know, he was going to come with his kingdom. He was going to just wipe the, the people out. And it was just going to be war. And they was going to have a king. It was just going to be this intense battle scene. Right? This is what they were thinking in their in their um, in their early minds, yeah. you know. But they weren't able to see, you know, what God was setting up. You know, they did, they heard the conversation, but they didn't sink in. They heard what they were talking about, but they didn't understand. It's like, how can he be the king if he's going to suffer and die? Doesn't make sense. You know, none of this makes sense to them. You know, so they're so they're pondering all of this, and then and then Jesus is like, all right, don't say nothing. Anymore. <laughs> right, you know, so now they now they can't even talk about this because you know, truthfully, what are they gonna say? <laughs> they can't even explain it. So it would have just made more things more complicated. But you know, Jesus wants them to hold hold this uh, these thoughts to themselves and ponder it, you know, and keep it to themselves. You know, you know, they 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 thought the kingdom was supposed to come with power. So now everything is just shaking and changing. You know, so they're confused. There's uncertainty. There's doubt. You know, everything just starts to creep back in. You know, and sometimes this is a hard thing to, to connect with. You know, the transfiguration is an amazing story, but it's so much more than that. It's not just a story. This is, this is God revealing himself to us. You know, and I feel like his disciples, meantime, are just confused. Like, I don't quite get this. I'm not all 100% there. And even now, I'm like, there's still so much to learn from this. You know, it's not a scripture that you, you get, you got it, like ah, you move on to the next thing. This is this is one of those things you have to continue to to, to process and, and think about. You know, you know, I'll, I'll have my top of the mo top of the mountain moments. You know, only to come down the mountain and my 
character defects are still waiting there for me. Mm -hmm. You know, my troubles are still waiting for, for me. Fear, insecurity, all that's just waiting right there. As soon as I get off the mountain, you know. You know but the difference between us and the disciples in this moment is the disciples didn't have the Holy Spirit at that time. Yeah. You know, they didn't have the any loving spirit, you know, with them. You know, so we do. You know, we have the pleasure of having God's divine spirit living within us. You know, so we can still shine. You know, we can still come back down the mountain and still shine with that love, you know, from, from within. Like imagine, imagine the world, what the world would be like if we all morphed. We all were version 2.0 of you, yourself, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you were allowed, if you allowed yourself to be changed fully, you know, and allow the radiance of God to shine through you, what would this world be like? What would your home be like? What would your community be like? You know. And I'll and I'll leave with this quote. I like it so much. I wrote it back. Um, <laughs> it's not like the moon reflecting the sun, but like but like allowing the but shining like the sun, you know, shining through us. I just completely put you down. We are not the moon that reflects the sun. We are the one in whom the sun lives. You know, Christ lives and dwells within us. You know, it's time for us to let him shine.